Are we prepared for a worst case scenario? California may be in the middle of a severe drought, but climate change is doubling the risk of catastrophic flooding. It's what some call a mega flood. Our team of meteorologists went to the top interviewing state's lead researchers for months, asking what is a mega flood? What damage could it do? And are we ready? Tonight, Monica Woods looks back on the spillway crisis in Oroville five years ago and also looks ahead at what the state is doing to prepare for the worst. All of our tools were tough march on the water. It looks like a bomb went off there. Imagine the biggest storm you have ever been through. He had to chainsaw his way out his front door. Cold, hard rain has local creeks and rivers running high. All this came underneath the doors. What if the rain didn't stop? A levee breaks and now your neighborhood is taking on water. In Sacramento region alone, there's over 514,000 people that are protected by these levees. Studies suggest that Sacramento is actually one of the top 10 in the nation, most at risk for flooding due to rivers. The most intense atmospheric river storms are likely to become significantly more intense. And certainly this spillway incident was one of those instances where we did not have time. Are we prepared? This is mega flood. We're already in a world where the likelihood of a catastrophic flood has doubled at any given year. And that's the kind of thing that keeps people like, like us up at night. Brian Johnson is a member of the Central Valley Flood Protection Board. Their mission, updating the state's plan to keep us all safe from catastrophic flooding. People talk about how we may be overdue for the big one for an earthquake in Northern California. That's probably true for the big flood as well. A flood event that would dwarf the record-breaking water year of 2017, when the Oroville Reservoir couldn't hold the amount of water coming in from rain and Sierra snowmelt. February of that year, we had a series of storms coming into the lake. We were operating the lake like we normally do to hold back some of the water and then release it gradually into the Feather River when we found um, the damage in the spillway. Unfortunately, um, it was damage that was too large to repair and really resulted in a failure of this, this spillway. Making it nearly impossible to release enough water from the rapidly rising lake, putting pressure on the country's tallest dam, standing over 70 stories high. The risk of massive flooding growing by the hour for people living in the valley below. Well, me as a mom, um, the first thing I thought was, get my family out of there. You know, um, it was, excuse me. Um, it was very scary at that moment. One set of parents down the street, the other 20 minutes away. Mariana and David moving quickly. It was mayhem for a while, man. People were going crazy here. And a life they worked so hard to build, hanging in the balance. I mean, friends here, I mean, you know, our house where I was born at. I mean, it's just, <laughs> uh, like, for example, this, we built this ourselves here. We put the trailer here, we put the porch here. I mean, things we worked or, you know, tears, blood and sweat type of deal into it. I mean, imagine all that going to... Yeah, I mean, yes. losing it. You work so much, you just feel like somebody just took it away from you. The Rodriguez's remembering the night they and nearly 200,000 others got the call for immediate evacuation. The state responding to reduce the risk of a repeat. 13 million pounds of reinforcing steel was put in place here. And then additionally at the emergency spillway over to the uh, left here, uh, we placed uh, 750 a thousand cubic yards of concrete to help protect the hillside. I'm walking on top of the country's tallest dam, holding back over 3.5 million acre feet of water. Now, if this whole facility were to fail, it would send all of that water downhill, flooding areas like Oroville, Marysville, and even into Sacramento. The valley is a natural floodplain, sitting thousands of feet lower than our highest peaks. Snowmelt and runoff move downhill, filling reservoirs. When water is released, it keeps moving downstream to rivers, a dangerous place for accumulating water. The Sacramento River as a whole is called a perched river, which means the bottom, the flow line, the bottom of the river, in many cases is, is higher than the land that's on each side of it. So the river is actually higher than the surrounding land. The only thing holding back this water are what we call levees. In Sacramento region alone, there's over 514,000 people that are protected by these levees. One break in the system can cause deadly and massive destruction like these levee breaks in Yuba County from 1986 and 97. The communities that would most likely be affected, it would be in the low-lying areas of the valley. They were effectively wetlands 
and now they're being protected by levees. Like Natomas, West Sacramento, the city of Sacramento, Stockton, Lathrop, and Manteca, all home to large growing community developments. And that's why close to $8.3 billion is being spent on levee improvements through a federal civil works program. By the funds that have been allocated, we've We've improved about 140 miles of um, the 300 miles with about another 160 miles more to go. Which will offer protection to about 1.1 million people and over $100 billion worth of assets. Near where the Sacramento and American Rivers meet, another big project is underway to move water away from high-risk areas in Sacramento and Yolo counties. This is the Lower Elkhorn Basin Levy Setback Project. We're setting back the existing Sacramento Bypass Levy by approximately 1,500 feet and the Yolo Bypass Levy by approximately 1,500 feet. This will help alleviate downstream water flows by allowing more water to flow into beneficial areas for agriculture and the environment. This project is being implemented in close coordination with another project coming shortly, the Sacramento Weir Widening Project. Together, these will reduce the water surface elevation in the Sacramento River by as much as a foot, adding another layer of protection during big flood events. But these structural changes can only do so much in the face of climate change, with research showing California's risk of a megastorm doubling due to warming. It, it will be a challenge uh, for sure because the, the infrastructure that was constructed back in the 30s, 40s and 50s, like the, the, the dams um, and, and levees, and the hydrology information that was available at the time at which those structures were designed is pre all, all of this. Joe says this is a time of renaissance though, with improving forecasts giving water managers like the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers new flexibility in a program called FIRO. F-I-R-O, Forecast Informed Reservoir Operations. And it's this uh, idea that if you understand um, forecasted events better, if you can get better forecasts, then you can make better water management decisions. Knowing when to keep water in and when to let water out. We've made significant progress, but that progress isn't happening at a pace and scale that we know is needed. And with climate change, winning slowly is losing. Winning slowly is losing. <laughs> well, while we don't like a drought, it kind of is a double-edged sword because right. we do get some construction done. So. Right, and it's needed construction. As you were seeing there, $8.3 billion being spent on that. I love what Todd Bernardi said in our interview, and I wasn't able to include it, but he said, it's like getting in a car. Mm -hmm. You always put on your seatbelt for fear of getting in a car crash. You're hoping you don't need it, but if you do, you're glad that you have the protection. That is like our levees and dams Spend the money now in drought periods to get protected for the potential of something like a catastrophic mega flood. And Monica, something that we've been covering here on To The Point mm -hmm. are unhoused individuals living in the levees. And it's something that we've seen. It's something that we've been following, which is not only dangerous should something break, but it's also concerning because it causes some risk to the integrity of the infrastructure. Right. And so that makes it vulnerable. What happens is you kind of burrow into that. Let's say there's big water flows coming through. It continues to press on that and erode parts of the levee. Now, it's not just the homeless or people that are unhoused. It's also beavers and some of the wildlife that are out there. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, they do a lot of surveys to make sure that those levees are intact and structurally sound. All right, Monica, thank you so much. We you appreciate bet. it. We also have another piece that's coming up tomorrow, um, and we'll be looking at how do you mm -hmm. evacuate. Like you said, Oroville Dam, when it broke, some 200,000 people had to get out. Scary stuff, and it is something that Brendan's going to be looking at tomorrow. Yeah. Yep. All right, Monica, thank you. Mm -hmm. Again, our series on mega floods runs all this week right here on To The Point. Make sure you don't miss it. For more about what a flood could do, visit us online at abc10.com slash to the point. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're breaking down today's headlines and the history just made using 192 laser beams. All right, well, if you're just getting in the door today, we have some headlines coming out of Northern California. So... Buckle up. A man is dead after he was shot by a deputy in the small town of Waterford in Stanislaw County. Deputy showed up to a home after 27 year old Bradley Lachlan's roommate told them that Lachlan had fired a gun inside of the house. After nearly an hour, Lachlan went outside and fired at least one shot. A deputy then shot Lachlan with a single round. The deputy who fired his weapon is now on administrative leave. He and the other people in the house were not hurt. 
The San Juan Unified School District says that someone called San Juan High School in Citrus Heights about a possible explosive device. The school was put on a precautionary shelter in place for just a few hours, but no evidence was found. And this comes less than 24 hours after Del Campo High School was put on lockdown just yesterday after a report of a student with a gun. Thankfully, nothing was found there either. And then we go to a groundbreaking discovery that came out of the Bay Area today. Researchers at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California have achieved fusion ignition. So that is when more energy is created from nuclear fission reactions than what is needed to start the process. These conditions are only found in stars like our sun. Researchers now have to figure out how to harness that sustainable clean energy on a widespread level. And another day, another shortage. This time, it's inside the courtroom, and it's causing some major consequences. That's after the break. Our court systems are in crisis. The Superior Court System of California says that tens of thousands of cases are being held every day due to shortages. Our Devin Truby shadows the vital role that our 54 court systems now banding together to find a solution. Some, it looks like another language. It's called stenotype. Translating a dictionary that's specific to Dixie Cooksey into English. I've been a court reporter for 40 years. That's a really good career. She works in a career in crisis. Dixie is doing a job that more than 70% of California courts are hiring for. And now with the schools closed, I think that's why we have a shortage. Court reporting isn't offered at many, if any, community colleges and universities, most specialized schools have closed. And if you find a specialized program, the chance of passing the test is 20%. That's always been the case, and it is very difficult. It requires just a lot of practice and dedication. It's a norm that's put Butte County in need. They only have two of the seven court reporters they need. The court is coming up with alternatives. It does have the potential to uh, delay proceedings. Fortunately, here in Butte, um, we have been able to avoid that occurrence by securing remote reporters um, and implementing electronic recording technology. But a judge has to approve it. That may be in conflict with California law, which is not a position we like to be in. Currently in California, you are mandated to have a court reporter for felony, criminal, and dependency and delinquency juvenile courtrooms. Pay heed to the right to a record for the purposes of appeal, which is a right provided under the United States Constitution. Butte, Placer, and Sacramento counties tell ABC 10 they have not held any cases because of the shortage. But in Placer County, court executives say the shortage impacts civil and family cases the most. Reporters aren't mandated in those cases, but people still want an official record in case of an appeal. Often we don't have a court reporter to provide to take down the official record. Um, and as it currently stands, we're also not able to take that down in an alternative method. It has to be an in-person court reporter. And if they're not available, then no record is taken. Or parties have to seek out their own court reporter through the private market. The state legislator has approved $30 million a year to hire reporters to fix this problem. But there is no one to hire. That is why the superior courts are asking for a statutory change. Be remote court reporting where the reporter isn't physically in the courtroom, uh, or it could be a digital recording of the proceedings. It's just not something you always think about. Not at all. <laughs> now, this holds up federal cases, but what are some of the other repercussions of this happening? Oh, definitely civil cases. I want you to imagine just a nasty divorce that's handled in court. Do you want to have to call your ex or rely on <laughs> notes for alimony or who gets what? Or do you want to just look at the official record without having to have any contact? That's what you want. And yeah. Even though it's not mandated, it is vital for these cases, for things just like that. Any new technology coming out with this? Yeah, so in January, there's going to be something, and it's actually called voice writer. So those are people that they're going to speak into a device in the courtroom. You're not going to hear them, and it's going to catch everything they say and create a record. So that gets rid of all that hard typing, that stenotype that you saw. So hopefully more people maybe could qualify for that. Well, and we have a lot of technology already that can transcribe. You know, we have voice to text. Yes. You know, there's things like Otter and different companies. Why not just use that? Yeah, that's a great question. But I asked the court reporter and she said, honestly, it's just not very good. It doesn't pick mm. up an accent or emotion that people are feeling in those courtrooms. It's really best only for yes or no answers in the court setting. So that's why it's just not working for this yet. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, Devin, thank you so much. I appreciate it.
All right, when a man from Amador County community of Jackson wrote in to tell us about his Christmas village, we knew we had to talk to him. Becca Hobbaker introduces us to Mr. Holiday himself and why this annual tradition is definitely worth checking out. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas in Jackson. Everywhere you go, but especially at the offices of the Ledger Dispatch newspaper. Come on in. Come on in. Newspaper publisher Jack Mitchell and Michael Brewer are leading the tour. You're going to start them with the new table already? Yes. This just came in last week. Pieces donated to Michael's ever-growing Christmas Village collection. Some big buildings, some churches. Everybody really loves to see what Christmas is all about. Ten houses. It's a tradition Michael and his mom started 25 years ago, back when they had just 10 buildings. How many have you got now, Michael? 262. So there's all kinds of different buildings, like the fire departments, post office, toy stores, candy shops, and all that. There's numerous churches. Every building has a story, and every year the story is different. Santa does crazy stuff, like tipping the cow. Michael puts his friends in the village too, assigning them a new building every year. When I first met him, he had, what, 80 people in the village? <laughs> right now, so. With stories for each one. Michael opened his display to the public in 2019. Back then, he was inviting people into his Jackson home to see it. He called me on a story and said, hey, I've got this uh, village in my house, I'm trying to get people to come see it. He had, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 buildings set up and, and a really nice display. And then he started talking about all of these people in the village and all these backstories. I just knew it was something that was really special. So he invited Michael to move the display to the newspaper the next year and dubbed him Mr. Holiday. Jack did give me that nickname and I kind of kind of stuck to it him. kind of stuck. Mr. Holiday's Amador County famous Christmas village has been at the Ledger Dispatch every holiday season since, along with the stories that go with it. Where's Jack this year? He doesn't know this. Since I'm the mayor of this whole village this year, He's the vice mayor of the village. Did you, did you hear that? <laughs> because of Michael and who he is and who Mr. Holiday is, the donations that came in and this growth of this village and the number of people that know about his mother and how this started and the history of it. Michael is dedicating this 25th anniversary of the Christmas Village to his parents, Vina and Bob Jopp. She was a foster parent for 40 years. When I was two years old, they took the guardianship of me, and that's how I became part of this family. His mom died in 2010. His dad died a year later. That must have been really hard for you. It was hard, and that's when the community has really come to support me throughout all my years up here. I've been up here 13 years. I always said he's my special needs brother I never knew I always needed. Uh, he, he keeps the holiday in his heart, and of course it takes someone like Michael, uh, Mr. Holiday, to wake you up and say, hey, you know what, it's time to do something together. After all, they say, it takes a village. And you can see Mr. Holiday's Amador County famous Christmas village for yourself. It's open when Jackson's Ledger Dispatch newspaper offices are open, which is weekdays, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And Mr. Holiday says that you can also make an after hours appointment and he'll personally give you a tour. I think that's great, especially if you have family coming into town. We have a link to his Christmas Village Facebook page at abc10.com slash to the point. All you have to do is just look for the links mentioned article and it's all right there. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at our Gilmore backyard here. Not too bad outside, still seeing some pretty chilly weather. Let's take a quick look at our mountain, hills, and coast. I'm sorry, our current temperatures, Sacramento, Stockton, Modesto here. Now let's go ahead and take a look at our mountain, hills, and coast here. So we have some cold mornings, beautiful afternoons, really good travel weather. Uh, chance of rain, though, is coming next week, so we'll go ahead and see that. Before we go, I do want to remind you that more than 1 million people in our area do not know where their next meal is coming from. But you can still help and donate to ABC 10's Stand Against Hunger campaign through this Sunday, which is December 18th. All you have to do is just text the word hunger to 916-321-3310. We'll send you all the info that you need. And I also want to report that we are upwards of $230,000. That's more than 2 million meals, all paid by your generosity. So thank you so much. I hope you have a great night. See you tomorrow.
Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone, and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at ToThePoint at ABC10.com, or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.